hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. Plenty of news on the radiation leak at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant site in Carlsbad, New Mexico this week, and we will be focusing on it in a special report with interviews with three activists on the front lines of the battle. Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center, Karen Haddon of the SEED Coalition in Texas, and Diane DiRigo, Radioactive Waste Project Director at Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NIRS. What's happening? Where's the waste going, and what's it going to cost we the taxpayers? All that information in interviews, plus features and numbnuts of the week, coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 29, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Time to catch up with some international stories. There was victory in Taiwan as demonstrators, 28,500 of them in a single demonstration, forced the Taiwanese government to announce that it would stop construction at a controversial nuclear power plant. Protesters broke through a police cordon on Sunday, April 27, to take control of a busy eight-lane intersection, demanding an end to construction on the Nuke 4 power station outside Taipei. Later that day, the ruling Kuomintang party yielded to pressure and promised to stop work at the plant. They further said that only safety checks will be done, and after that, it, the Reactor 1, will be sealed for storage, and construction of Reactor 2 will be terminated. Woohoo! However, they also said that in the future, any of its commercial operation will be decided by referendum. Big loophole. Still, I wonder what it would take to make 28,500 people in America march against nukes. France may be the world's most nuclear energy-dependent country, but it looks like it's about to increase the amount of wind-sourced electricity in its power mix. The percentage of wind-powered electricity in the country is currently at 3%, and the country is looking to more than double it by 2020. That's good news, but they better hurry, because France's oldest nuclear power plant, Fessenheim, 37 years old, was shut down on Saturday, April 19, following an incident when a valve in control of the steam supply of the turbine generator accidentally closed. Reactor 1 of the plant has been out of operation since April 9, following a leak in a water supply pipe. You know, these things get old, they leak. France, put them out of their misery, shut them down, and put up some windmills. Over to Pakistan, where that country may ban Japan edible items in case traces of radioactive material are found on them. Back in April of 2011, the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority had directed authorities dealing with cargo arriving directly or even indirectly from Japan, be they edible or inedible, to be screened for radiation. The directives were issued from the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority. The PNRA made clearance mandatory for every consignment being imported from Japan. Can you imagine the NRC being that concerned about foodstuffs and non-foodstuffs from Japan coming into America? <laughs> Over to Canada. And yes, Canada is another country, Americans. A four-member group has filed a report with the federal panel examining Ontario Power Generation's proposal to bury low- and intermediate-level nuclear waste in a limestone formation 680 meters, meaning not quite half a mile, below the surface on the shore of Lake Huron. Class, can you say water table? Now dig it. An expert group. That's what it's called. No names, no credentials, just the label, expert, has said that the 
immense waters of the Great Lakes will greatly dilute any radiation-bearing water that might leak from a proposed nuclear waste site on Lake Huron. First of all, you don't dilute radiation. It can disperse, but each one of those little particles is still just as potent as it was when it was grouped with all of its buddies. As for the, eh, there's so much water, nobody will notice. That's what's been said about every major body of water that has ended up showing enormous signs of pollution. A little and a little and a little equals, ah, how did it happen? This is how it happens. Fortunately, the questionable wisdom of this is being questioned more deeply than it might have been otherwise because even up in Canada, they're freaked out about what's happening at the WIP site. Over to Russia, where construction of a contamination shield at the damaged, <laughs> that's a euphemism, damaged Chernobyl nuclear power plant could be delayed amid the ongoing political crisis in Ukraine. Adi Roche, the CEO of aid agency Chernobyl Children International, told the Irish Independent, what can never be forgotten is that the destruction caused by the deadly explosion at reactor number four at Chernobyl was triggered by the release of just 3% of the radioactive material in the plant. The remaining 97% of this enormous ticking time bomb of highly unstable nuclear material is still inside the crumbling Chernobyl complex. She went on to say, The world has very real reasons to be extremely concerned about the ongoing threat posed by Chernobyl, especially at a time of great instability and growing hostility between Ukraine and Russia. So world, pay attention. This is bigger than Putin's ego and the Pentagon budget combined. Make Chernobyl a political free world zone and get the lid on it before the sarcophagus falls apart. When it was built, they predicted it would last for 30 years. Right now, it's 28 years. We need to get this thing covered now. And for those who believe the folklore that the 1,000-kilometer exclusion zone around the radioactive ruins of Chernobyl has become a thriving wildlife refuge, Bob Alvarez, senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, has this to say. Over the past 13 years, extensive wildlife effect surveys were done by the University of South Carolina in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, with findings published in some 50 scientific publications. They report most organisms studied show significant increased rates of genetic damage in direct proportion to the level of exposure to radioactive contaminants. Many organisms show increased rates of deformities and developmental abnormalities in direct proportion to contamination levels. Many organisms show reduced fertility rates. Many organisms show reduced lifespans. Many organisms show reduced population sizes. Biodiversity is significantly decreased. Many species are locally increased. Mutations are passed from one generation to the next and show signs of accumulating over time. And mutations are migrating out of affected areas into the populations. The New York Times did a really good job in their article of April 27, 2014, on Fukushima and now the plan to move residents back into that prefecture by March of next year. The government has announced that stipends will end next March for the people displaced by the nuclear disaster, and temporary housing will also begin to be closed. Villagers who moved back before then will receive a $9,000 bonus from TEPCO. Blood money. Evacuees are already feeling increased pressure to go back from a government that wants to limit criticism of the powerful nuclear industry. TEPCO refuses to comment beyond saying that it had so far paid out $36 billion. Chump change to nuclear. Nuclear hot seat correspondent Umi Hagatani reports that survivors of the 2011 Northeast earthquake who are living in Osaka public housing are being asked to sign a consent form when they extend their stay. It is addressed to the governor of Osaka, whom Umi very generously characterizes as a notorious ultra-right-wing sexist, classist, racist. The consent form reads in part, I understand that I rent my housing as a part of generous 
relief for emergency cases, so I hereby consent to my removal by the date stated by Osaka Prefecture. They are obligated to leave immediately if they cause any damage, inconvenience, or annoyance to other residents. I wonder if talking about Fukushima's health problems falls under that category. And there are other requirements as well. Katsutaka Idagawa, former mayor of Futuba in Fukushima Prefecture, on an interview on RT.com, said, There are still about 2 million people living in the prefecture who have all sorts of medical issues. The authorities claim this has nothing to do with the radiation fallout from Fukushima. I demanded that the authorities substantiate their claim in writing, but they ignored my request. There is no one to help us. We need to admit that actually many people are dying. We are not allowed to say that. Of his own health, Itagawa said, I now get exhausted quickly. It's harder to speak. I often get colds. My eyesight worsened. I have a cataract. My stomach hurts. My skin is very dry. I have muscular weaknesses in different parts of my body. These are the consequences. I'm not getting any treatment right now. Actually, there's no place I could go for help. I now live in Saitama. The nearest hospital refused to treat me. So I'm trying to restore my health through nutrition. And now... Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. None nuts out of the week. Well, if you want to convince people that it's okay to eat sushi, that fish from the Pacific is just okay. And by the way, we're doing this to help get rid of a politician we really don't like. Just get President Obama to sit at a sushi bar in Tokyo and eat sushi. Bet your $6.5 billion buddies down at Vogel Nuclear in Georgia didn't tell you about the need for liquid zeolite, did they? Gee, Mr. President, that's why you get to be this week's Nuts of the Week. Before we get to this week's featured interviews, I wanted to let you know that work is now underway to get the Nuclear Hot Seat website up and at them again after its hack attack. We do have a temporary redirect page up at the regular address, NuclearHotSeat.com, and we will be posting there for the time being with links to each new episode, including this one. Our archive is up on iTunes under podcasts, and you can also catch the last few of our shows on YouTube as well under Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Regarding the website, the fix is going on, and it is expensive. I want to thank everyone who has been supportive of me and this show with your comments, suggestions, and bless you, donations. There's a donate button on our temporary page, and yes, it is secure. If you can, please, anything you can donate will be greatly appreciated and go immediately to the cost of fixing the website. Now for this week's interviews. We focus special attention on the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. First, if you haven't been following this story, here's a recap. The WIP site is a deep geological repository licensed to permanently hold and dispose of some forms of radioactive waste. It opened in 1999 and was supposed to hold this deadly radioactive waste safely away from people and the environment for 10,000 years. But on February 14th, Happy Valentine's Day, the site experienced a radiation leak that released an unspecified amount of plutonium and americium into the environment. There goes the neighborhood. Seriously, 21 workers are confirmed to have been contaminated by the radiation, and there are no accurate readings as to how much was released or how far it went. Last week, the Department of Energy released a 300-page report on the accident, a document that satisfied no one except maybe the people who wrote it and their mothers. Where does all this stand now? First, we talk with Don Hancock. He is director of Southwest Research and Information Center, an environmental watchdog group based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don has been a reliable source for information on this accident since it began and has been featured previously on nuclear hot seats number 139, 140, 143, and 146. Here he is on number 149. Don, since last we spoke, the Department of Energy's Accident Investigation Board released a 300-page report on the accident at the WIP site. 
what, if anything, do they cite as the direct cause of the accident? They don't do a very good job, in my view. They said they didn't know what actually caused the release in the underground, but they presumed that the release in the underground was caused by a roof fall. That's what they said in the report. Now, one of the unanswered questions about the report is why was the report finished on April 1st and then not released for three weeks? But therefore, it was three weeks out of date when it was released, and there now have been workers underground who said there is no roof fall. So as I say, they don't know what the cause is, and their speculation of what the cause is seems to be wrong based on what we know now. They also said that, okay, so the release happened in the underground, but the reason it got out some of it got out into the environment was because of a design flaw in the ventilation system that included two dampers that weren't designed to fully close. And since they didn't fully close, some of the radiation from the underground was vented directly out into the environment rather than going through the HEPA filters as it was supposed to. And they said that that was a design flaw. They should have known about it. So they say the ventilation system, and particularly the filtration system, had a fundamental flaw in it. That's true. We know that there was some release because of the dampers. That still doesn't tell us how much. And it doesn't really satisfy me that that was the only way that waste was released. But they don't discuss at all how it is that the 21 workers got contaminated. And they don't discuss at all how it could be that the only contamination is what 21 workers breathed in. They continued in the report to say there's no evidence of any significant contamination other than the 21 workers. Well, that defies logic and science and physics and everything else. I mean, that what what came out through those two leaking dampers didn't all just go to 21 workers, some of whom weren't even on the site when this release happened. But none of those questions did this report address. I find it interesting that in that statement they used the word significant and that there was no evidence. There's no evidence that they don't seek the data. And significant is one of those wobbly, spin-speak words that can reframe something as pay no attention, don't worry your pretty little head, as opposed to something actually happened. And they should have, in my view, totally within the scope of their report, should have been to analyze why, whether it was inadequate equipment, inadequate worker use of the equipment, inadequate training or other things, why it is that they didn't have the evidence and they didn't develop the evidence that this leak happened and the contamination was out there and the contamination went to more than just the 21 workers. It's in the air. It's now a lot of it's in the soil and we don't know where, et cetera, et cetera. But they, as I say, they didn't discuss those things. So in my view, while there's some useful and some new information in the report, it's very inadequate in terms of what it was trying to cover. I find it fascinating that there is, in this report from Board Chairman Ted Weika, he said that more than a 10-hour response to the initial emergency alarm, and that, this is a direct quote, the bottom line is they failed to believe initial indications of the release which would make this akin to Three Mile Island where nobody wanted to believe that the radiation that was showing up was as high as it was. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, this was an event that was never supposed to happen. So everything that everybody had thought and learned up to that time was nothing could happen. The report does point out correctly that the underground air monitoring system, there were were supposed to be four continuous air monitors functioning at the time the release happened. Only one of the four was functioning. And the one that was functioning then had failed earlier on, uh, just a few days earlier. And the problem, the accident board said, is there had been a number of false alarms 
from these continuous error monitors. So both because the mindset was nothing like this can happen and because you had had false alarms in the past, the reaction was, as you stated, oh, well, we have another alarm, but that can't be right kind of thing, uh, both because our, our mentality is that it can't be happening and we have experience of the monitors doing false alarming. That's very troubling on both angles, both sides of that, that you would think that you wouldn't really be careful on the one hand and know that it is dangerous and it can happen and we shouldn't be overly confident. And two, that when you have a system where you know that your monitors have failed, that you don't have multiple redundant ones. So, you know, if there had been four operating and one saying there's a release and three others properly stationed are saying there isn't, then you have some ability to say, oh, well, maybe this is another false alarm. But when you've only got one operating and it there's an alarm, you got, you should behave as if it is a real alarm. This goes to a point that was made in the report that Nuclear Waste Partnership has exhibited poor management and eroding safety culture, ineffective maintenance, and a lack of proper oversight for radiation release, which is a pretty damning combination in dealing with a nuclear site. What is going to happen to them, or what could happen to Nuclear Waste Partnership as a result of this accident and this evaluation of them? Well, I'm going to say two things. I've been saying for several years what the accident board said, and I've been being ignored by Nuclear Waste Partnership and DOE on that subject for several years. I've also, as the accident board didn't, talked about why that declining safety has occurred, and in my view, it's significantly related to the fact that Nuclear Waste Partnership and DOE have been interested in expanding WIP to other missions so that Nuclear Waste Partnership can have more money and operate longer at the facility. And that's a direct cause of the reason there is an oversight is because the overseers are out promoting other missions rather than overseeing the safety. That goes for both Nuclear Waste Partnership and the DOE folks. That why that declining safety has happened, the, the accident board report didn't go into. But having said that, answering your question, unfortunately, based on past experience with DOE, Nuclear Waste Partnership's reward will be a reward. They will get more money because now they'll have to do, you know, they'll have to do some amount of cleanup. They have to do some amount of retraining. They have to bring in some new, more experienced people in dealing with nuclear safety. And Nuclear Waste Partnership has already said that's what they're doing. Well, their reward will be, okay, since you failed and you need to bring in new people, we will pay you more to bring in new people and continue operating. That would be typical of DOE, not just at WIF but at other sites. A lot of us would argue that since Nuclear Waste Partnership has had this contract for less than a year and a half of a five-year contract with a renewal clause in it, that they've clearly not carried out the terms of the contract, and therefore the contract could be terminated. But I don't expect at this point that that's what DOE will do, but that's certainly something that should be considered because they, Nuclear Waste Partnership has been shown not to be able to operate the facility in the start clean, stay clean, no radiation release mode. So that should certainly be considered as well. And in the broader scheme of things, given this continuing history, not just at WIP, but at Hanford and Oak Ridge and Idaho and Nevada and South Carolina and all of its other major sites like Los Alamos, there have been leaks and problems and errors and safety problems and people being contaminated and contractors not fulfilling their job. One also must entertain the idea of whether the Department of Energy is actually the correct federal agency to be operating such facilities, and we also need to consider what role the regulators played in lack of regulating uh, the facility. Going to possible causes of the accident, there have been reports that a green burst was seen in the utility yard just minutes before the radiation release began, that there was a popping noise heard, 
and emergency personnel reported reddish brown vapors observed within hours after the radiation release began. Do you have any familiarity with this and how it might impact the understanding of how the accident happened? What I know about it is what I've heard from various sources. The accident board gives very short shrift, mentions the popping uh, 20 minutes before, et cetera, very, gives very short shrift to it, and they don't say why, but presumably because this is in the area of the utilities on the surface, which is more than a mile away from where the release happened, and so presumably they're presuming there can't be any connection between those events on the surface and what happened in the underground. The vapors, again, same kind of thing. There's no obvious necessary direct connection. So once again, the report mentioned some of these things but didn't really go into them in great detail about trying to resolve what they actually were, what the popping sound was, what the things that uh, workers saw, what they actually were and whether they meant. So I certainly think it's worthwhile to have some further investigation about those things. I continue to believe that something happened in the underground with one or more of the 258 contact handled waste containers in panel 7 in the underground, and we still don't know, and DOE agrees and admits they still don't know what happened. That's why all of these things need to be investigated Frankly, it's why I think we need an independent investigation, not just depending on five DOE employees to be the Accident Investigation Board, which is the case. So, yes, there's still a lot that is unknown and unresolved. How far have crews been able to get underground to explore the possible cause of the accident? So they've been underground, and last Wednesday they actually went to where they currently have seen the highest levels of contamination in the underground, to where these 258 containers are in Panel 7 and Room 7. And they went to what's called the face, in other words, the last place that wastes were stacked there, and they took radiation readings. They did get significant radiation readings, 10,000 disintegrations per minute in the air. But when they looked, everything, the containers that they could see all looked like they were when they were put in. So it wasn't like there were containers on the floor broken open or anything like that. So they found the radiation. Their procedures were that they were taking a ladder along and they were actually supposed to actually get up on the ladder so they could look over the top because there is a gap. The containers are stacked, but they don't actually go all the way to the 13-foot high salt ceiling. So if you get on a ladder, you can look over. And they said they could look over and they could see the ceiling all the way to the back. It appeared that there hadn't been any ceiling collapse, not only on the outside, this face of where the containers are, but all the way back over where the 258 containers were. So they got down, and then they went to kind of the back side. So this is room seven, and they went around back to the end of room six to look kind of at the back of that stack of 258 containers. They said they looked, and again, it looked all okay, but the levels that they were reading there were twice as high, 20,000 disintegrations per minute. At this point, the highest levels of radiation they're picking up in the underground are at and near where these containers are, so that's still the working theory about the source of the leak, but just in looking at things, they can't, still can't figure out which drum containers have leaked. So now the next phase that they're working on is, okay, so now we need to be taking cameras that have boom extensions on, so in that space between the roof and the top of the waste containers, we can run a camera through there and kind of see what the camera can tell us about what's actually there. So that's, at this point, uh, the next thing that they're planning to do. Should the site ever be allowed to reopen? How is it going to be different for workers who go underground? 
My organization's view is that it can't be reopened until we know what the cause is, we know what was released, the public through an independent process know that any further release can't happen, that the contamination in the underground and on the surface needs to be completely cleaned up, and that any and all of the contaminated workers need to have adequate medical evaluation and treatment. So all of those things would need to happen before my organization and I think numbers of other people would think that WIPS should open. That, however, is not the Department of Energy's position. They continue to say that they're working hard to figure out as much as they're going to figure out and develop a plan, which is they're now saying they're they're going to have a plan by June 1st as to how they're going to get reopened. So that's their plan. And then just today, the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is part of the Department of Energy that deals with nuclear bombs, released a new report on what to do with 34 metric tons of surplus nuclear weapons plutonium. This is plutonium that was in nuclear bombs and has been pulled out of bombs as they were dismantled. And DOE has long had another failed project in mind to do this, to build what's called a MOX, Mixed Oxide Fuel Facility, at the Savannah River site in South Carolina to turn this plutonium into fuel for commercial nuclear power plants, which is a bad, expensive, unworkable idea, but DOE has spent about $4 billion taxpayer dollars on that, and a lot of People in South Carolina and my organization of others have been complaining about this and opposing this idea. Well, DOE for the last year has now kind of decided, well, things aren't working out very well. That facility may not work. No utility wants to have that fuel. It's very expensive. The facility is under construction. They don't know it will ever work, so they've been looking at alternatives. So just today they released their study of alternatives, and guess what? The best alternative is, according to this study released today, is sending this 34 metric tons of surplus plutonium, none of which was supposed to go to WIP, sending it all to WIP. (laughs) It's like the government's the right and the left hand don't know what they're doing. Of course, that's redundant. We know that one already. Go ahead. So here, once again, we're in kind of this Alice in Wonderland where Department of Energy is saying everything has been fine. We have a little bit of problem now, but don't worry, everything is going to be fine, and it's going to be so fine that we can not only reopen WIP for the waste that's supposed to go to WIP, we can reopen WIP to expand it, keep it operating for another three or four decades to handle this other uh, waste stuff. Again, we are in the situation where people in New Mexico and other places that are paying attention have to wonder who are these people that are in charge of this dangerous nuclear material and should they be the ones that should be in charge of it? In terms of the people who live in and around the WIP facility or might consider themselves downwinders at this point, Mm -hmm. what, if any, kind of protest or activism is taking place over and above what it is that you've been bringing to the table for so long? People in the Carlsbad area in southeastern New Mexico are not used to, it's not their style to protest. So there haven't been any protests down there for many years. The thing that's changed a little bit is that there are these weekly town hall meetings that are held in the Carlsbad City Council chambers that are co-sponsored by the mayor of Carlsbad and the Department of Energy. So each week, DOE officials and contractor officials come to have an hour and a half town hall in which they present some of what the current information is in terms of what's going on at WIP and allow people in the audience there to ask questions and to a more limited extent, people who are watching online, and these town hall meetings are live streamed online, so anybody who can get online can look at them. And so there's some amount of questioning online that's allowed. And so historically, 
uh, when there are public meetings or things like this idea that I just talked about of DOE saying, well, we can send a bunch of this stuff to WIP that's not supposed to come to WIP. Historically, there have been a couple of people in Carlsbad who have gone to those things and asked questions or raised concerns, but not more than that. What's been happening at these town halls, and we're now, you know, seven weeks into these weekly town halls, there continue to be people showing up at those town halls asking the kinds of questions, some of which are similar to what you've asked today, and are clearly not satisfied with all the answers they're getting. That's not a protest, but that's people in a company town, and in a company town you don't say things publicly against the company in this case, WIP and the partnership and DOE, there are people that are now at least asking harder questions and being willing to express some public skepticism. A couple of pieces of new information in the Accident Investigation Board report is there were two workers, one of whom was at the site at the time of the release and one of them who came the next day, who asked for the bioassay sampling to be done before that was DOE and the contractor decided they needed to do that. So again, that has not happened in the past with the workers saying, hmm, we aren't sure things are as safe as you keep telling us, we want to check for ourselves. So again, the fact that at least two of the 21 workers that have now been shown to be contaminated, were concerned about it and asked to be checked before they were asked or advised or otherwise requested to do so. That's a change from the past. So not protest, but yes, there is more questioning. There is more skepticism going on in uh, the Carlsbad area. People are asking for information that they'd never asked for in the past. So that's a good thing. There is more consciousness, more publicly expressed concern and questioning in the immediate vicinity than has been the case in the last 15 years going on. Any last thought you want to throw in that we haven't covered? There are always more things to cover, but I, 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 am, I, appreciate, I appreciate the fact that you are continuing to give time and interest to this issue, which I think, as you know, is important not just to folks in New Mexico, but folks around the country. So I, I, I appreciate your continued interest. Oh, you're not going to get rid of me on this one, Don. Okay, that's great. Well, you're not, they're not going to get rid of me. DOE has been hoping to get rid of me for more than 30 years about this. So they're not getting rid of me either. So I, I, I appreciate talking with you. Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center. When the website's back up, we will post a link to that Department of Energy surplus plutonium study that he mentioned. Next, I spoke with two strong, powerful women within our movement. Diane DeRigo is the Radioactive Waste Project Director for NIRS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, and Karen Haddon is the Executive Director of the Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition, or SEED Coalition. It's an environmental watchdog group located in Texas. Together, these two women filled in the picture of where the WIP nuclear waste is headed and what we face at Waste Control Specialists, or WCS, in Andrews, Texas. We started at the root of the problem with Diane's historical overview of how and why WIP came to be. Diane, going back into history, what was the intention behind the creation of the WIP site? The Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site is near Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico, and it was originally intended, and the agreements between the Environmental Protection Agency and the communities and citizens and government of New Mexico and the federal government was that they would only take weapons-generated nuclear waste and specifically transuranic waste, that means waste that's heavier than uranium. So it's uranium plus more, things like plutonium and americium and neptunium, and these are very, very long-lasting radioactive waste. The half-life times 10 or 20 is the hazardous life. This stuff is hazardous into the quarter to a half million years, uh, sometimes even longer than that. So it's essentially radioactive forever. 
and it's extremely dangerous if inhaled. It gives off alpha particles. These are kinds of radioactivity which are the worst if they're inhaled or ingested and then they lodge in the body and give off alpha particles from within, so it's like having a little X-ray machine within your body, and the power of the alpha particles is much, much stronger for the short penetrating distance that they have. So it's the worst of the radioactive materials to inhale or ingest. And the wastes are generated mainly at nuclear weapons sites, but they're also in irradiated fuel from nuclear power reactors. But the deal with WIP, the site in New Mexico, was that it's only supposed to take the stuff from the weapons program, not from the nuclear power program. There have been continual suspicions, concerns, threats that more waste could go there than what was originally contracted, high-level waste, et cetera. And in February, as you've been covering on your show, on February 5th, 2014, there was a fire in one of the trucks at the WIP site in New Mexico, and then potentially a completely separate event. On Valentine's Day of 2014, plutonium was detected off-site from the facility, attributable to the facility, and workers were exposed in inhaled radioactivity. So the WIP site was closed down, and it is a site that is supposed to take waste from the nuclear weapons locations, nuclear weapons complex around the country. In fact, the Department of Energy has contracts with the states in which these other nuclear weapons sites are located to bring material to this dump, and that's what they're trying to commit to. They're trying to stick with these contracts and the schedule, even though the site is now closed indefinitely, and we don't even know, even after this interim report that came out yesterday, what happened at the site. A 300-page report, and basically they don't really know what happened, and they will be reporting later when they figure it out. I love that it's a 300-page report that basically says we don't know what happened. The radioactive waste that's been generated from nuclear weapons production, nuclear atomic weapons around the country, it's been piling up for decades in Los Alamos, New Mexico, Savannah River, South Carolina, Hanford, Washington, National Engineering Labs in Idaho, and all of these sites threaten the aquifers where they are located, so nowhere is a good place for the material. The plan was to send it to this location. However, now this location has shown itself to not be a reliable place to isolate it. And despite that, the Department of Energy is continuing to take the waste on schedule. So they're going to bring it to a different place, Waste Control Specialists in Texas. And I'll let Karen talk to you about that. Karen, the waste now from WIP that is supposed to go to WIP is being shipped to the WCS site in Andrews, Texas, which is what you have been monitoring among many other sites in Texas for the SEED Coalition. Tell us about what's been happening to the waste as it arrives at WCS and why this is not a good idea. The waste coming from Los Alamos is being stored above ground in steel sheds. They do have a concrete floor, but this is waste that was originally going to go half a mile underground. Everything about the waste control specialist site is very, very questionable in my mind. The site never should have been opened at all based on the fact that eight employees at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality recommended denying the license. And they did so because of the concern about radioactive contamination of water. There is water very close to this site. There's been debate about whether it's directly over the Ogallala Aquifer, and the people who say that it's directly over the Ogallala Aquifer have been sued in the past by waste control specialists. And waste control specialists is owned by a Texas billionaire, is it not? Yeah, Texas billionaire Harold Simmons has been the owner of Waste Control Specialist. He recently passed away um, at close to $10 billion in his fortune. He's a major donor to Republican candidates in particular and some Democrats as well and was Governor Perry's number two all-time funder. 
he has funded um, the swift vote ads against Kerry when he was running his presidential race and has helped fund the campaign uh, for Obama as a Muslim at one point in time. So this is what happens with these billions of dollars. And the money gets spread not just in Texas, but in Congress to congressional representatives and, and senators to various locations around the country so that the company can ensure business from all around the country in terms of bringing in uh, commercial reactor waste. The site started out to be limited to Texas, Maine, and Vermont, and then was just down to Texas and Vermont. And after that, they managed to get our legislature here in Texas to expand the license to take waste from commercial reactors all around the country. So it's always shifting, and they're building a radioactive waste empire that grows daily, and they systematically are undoing all of the protections that they once had as requirements in their license. Their license is being loosened in every possible way. We believe or we know that the WCS site is located above the Ogallala Aquifer, which is under eight states and provides drinking water for the people in those states. How can there be a debate about a geological site or something that has been mapped? By the <laughs> That's a very good question. The maps in 1995 showed the Ogallala Aquifer under the WCS site and in that part of Andrews County which is right at the base of the panhandle on the New Mexico border. The map got changed in about 2006, the Texas Water Development Board map, and the aquifer boundary was shown further north. They say that was based on input from monitoring wells that waste control specialists had on site and data provided by Texas Tech University, where Kent Hans is now chancellor and Kent Hans is the vice president of WCS. So it sounds like this is Fox in the Hen House, let's protect our interests. Perhaps. Always. And the money flows so far and wide that WCS has a virtual monopoly on everything they touch. WCS has even given money to every single one of our Texas Supreme Court justices. So there's reason to at least suspect the new boundary on the Ogallala Aquifer. The company admits that the Ogallala uh, is at about six miles north of the site, and they claim that the waste and that the radionuclides could never move in that direction, but that just doesn't match what happens in nature. There's a lot of fracking. There's a lot of pathways underground that could the pathways that radioactive material could travel. People have asked questions since you mentioned fracking. There have been questions asked. I don't know whether any answers have been provided on how close to the site fracking takes place. The footprint is a smaller area, but then underneath the site expands much further out, and there has been fracking in this region of New Mexico. Let's get back to this is now waste that is being stored above ground in containers that normally would be half a mile underground in salt caverns. What could go wrong? That was rhetorical. I understand, <laughs> I understand that there is a time limit as to how long this waste is supposed to be on the WCS site. Can you talk to that? The existing license to WCS does allow them to store transuranic waste, but it does have a one-year time limit. DOE has said in their agreement that if it ran past that time, they would ask for a longer time frame. So there's no telling what exactly could or would happen. They have three buildings that this waste can fill up, and beyond that, they don't really have any more buildings that the waste could go into. And there's a lot of this waste sitting out there waiting for a place to go. So there's no telling how this will play out. And in terms of what could go wrong, there are actually many things that could go wrong, which is including tornadoes with this stuff stored above ground. Even though the area is dry, sometimes there are massive thunderstorms and flooding. There's concern about fires near Los Alamos. There have also been wildfires in West Texas in Andrews County 
some of them fairly close to this site that has a vast quantity now of radioactive waste next to a site that's called a RECRA site that has hazardous waste and corrosive chemicals. The thing that I find a bit interesting is that the transuranic waste, these wastes that are supposed to go to the WIP site for disposal, they've been at the weapons facilities for decades since they were generated. Some are pretty old. Some have been dug up and recontainerized. And I find it interesting that now, at this point, when the Department of Energy's disposal site is not able to take waste, that the Department of Energy is still committed to taking the waste, even though there's nowhere for it to really go. And, of course, waste control specialists love the idea of taking more waste of any kind. It's always wanted to take as much as possible. This is pretty clearly a foot in the door for high-level waste. It's not like the waste at these sites is safe. I'm certainly not saying that. I think all of us are very sympathetic with the inadequate way that the Department of Energy has for managing the waste at its sites. The situation, though, of committing to taking the waste and then bringing it to a place where it's only able to be stored for one year, they're setting themselves up for what's going to happen in a year. I mean, obviously, they're going to push to get a longer storage time if WIP doesn't reopen, and considering it's been over a month and they still don't know what even happened there, it's unlikely that it will. Many have suspicions about whether WIP will actually reopen. Could this be a step towards accepting high-level radioactive waste at the Texas WCS site? That is a huge concern of ours, that accepting this waste is a step toward accepting high-level waste in Texas. In fact, that was my first thought. Oh, here comes a huge quantity of transuranic waste. The high-level waste will surely follow. Well, sure enough, it wasn't a day or two later when Chuck McDonald, a spokesperson for waste control specialists, was saying the exact same thing. This is great for us. It shows that we can handle high-level waste. So I think that is what we can expect. Furthermore, when it comes to the transuranic waste, the experience so far with waste being stored at waste control specialists has been a real problem. They were storing waste from Studsvik, a processor in Tennessee, at the WCS site, and it sat there and sat there way past its deadline. Our organization filed a complaint about it with the environmental agency here. And what happened as a result was that there was no fine that was levied and no one required them to move the waste, which was what their license said should happen. Instead, the waste continued to stay at the site and was stored for a long time, and eventually it was buried. So that's what the experience has been so far. We hope that that won't be the experience with transuranic waste. But the concern, of course, is that the transuranic waste will continue to be brought in, that the one-year limit will be extended, as was for the Studzvik waste from the Tennessee processor, and that it will de facto become uh, a more permanent place for this waste for which it was never designed. They are not licensed for disposal, only storage of this waste. To give people a clear picture, at the WCS site, the waste is not stored underground. It's above ground in containers where it is open to whatever the elements have. Tornadoes in particular were a really frightening thought. And in terms of them being told that they have to get rid of the waste after a year, it is either a shell game or a hot potato where, where would it go? Exactly. Those are precisely our concerns. So, Diane, given this problem at WIP, which was supposed to last for, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 years and barely lasted 15 without this radiological accident taking place, what, if any, impact do you see this having on our national nuclear policy or the way business is done? If it's up to the Department of Energy, there will be no change. They do not want, they do not see anything as a big problem. And 
Fortunately, there is an investigation going on by the Defense Nuclear Facilities Board at the request of the New Mexico senators. That at least is somebody other than the Department of Energy looking at what happened. But unless the public really raises its concerns, the Department of Energy is more than happy to just shift over to disposal at WCS, I would imagine. In terms of the release of radiation and the fact that it was ongoing for perhaps 20 days and now we've got plutonium and americium released into the environment in our southwest, is there any other nuclear accident that has taken place that would parallel this one? I don't think we know enough about this one to be able to answer that question yet. Nuclear waste sites have leaked ever since there have been nuclear waste sites. When they get caught, that's actually a good thing because there's really no way to physically isolate this material for as long as it's hazardous. So if we at least are detecting that it's happening, then we've got a, a bit of a chance to control it. But unless the uh, government stops making more nuclear waste, we're not really on our way to solving it, and they're not in the mood to do that. It's not at all surprising that there was an ongoing leak. It always seems that that probably would be occurring, and some experts have pointed out that the filters don't get 100% of the waste. When you look into the fire report from February 5th, you find that one of the things that happened was that the ventilation curtains were cut. No one explained why that happened, whether it was for workers to breathe fresh air or to be able to see. Obviously, it was a nightmare scenario. So no one can tell us quite why. And now this initial report is alluding to problems with radiation coming up the ventilation shaft, in addition to uh, noting a green spark and arcing at the substation, the electric substation nearby, before this radiation got detected. So we have yet to find out fully what happened, but certainly... It's not surprising that there has, in fact, been ongoing radiation release. And WCS was originally it was pushed as, well, they actually touted that it was from medical. They, they said it would be paint cans. They never admitted even that it was nuclear power waste until really pressed. And then, then they began to admit that. But it's always a, a foot-in-the-door thing. Once they get away with putting some waste in a particular location, if they can get away with that, there's the danger of more coming in because there is no good place to store this waste. There's no place that can guarantee isolation from the environment. So the question is, who's going to be the sacrifice area? And unless somebody puts the brakes on it, WCS is in line to be that sacrifice area for not just this so-called low-level waste but also the transuranics, the high-level waste, the whole weapons and commercial waste streams. Anything else? Last minute, either one of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for giving us the chance to talk about this sort of secret site down in Texas. That was Diane DiRigo, Radioactive Waste Project Director for NEARS, and Karen Haddon, Executive Director of the SEED Coalition in Texas. We will be staying in touch with all three of these individuals as this story continues to unfold, because as with all things nuclear, the whip story is not going away in any foreseeable millennium. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 29, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENENews.com, Climate Connections, ENN.com, The Nation, TheStar.com, Bob Alvarez, Umi Hagatani, RIA Novosti, World Nuclear News, RT.com, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, AP, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Please stop by, say hello, be our friend. Special thanks this week to Sean Arclight and Christine Dillon Strickland for their ongoing help in posting Nuclear Hot Seat each week since the website meltdown. Theme music, written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated on UCY.tv. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, and hopefully we'll soon be back in business at nuclearhotseat.com slash blog. 
Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Lee B. Halevi and Hardestry Communications. You have my personal permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution, meaning website and my name, are included. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardestry Communications.